church. Good morning. Good morning. Those of you here in the sanctuary, and those of you who are going to be tuning in online, we welcome you as we gather together and we celebrate this Sunday morning. It's July 12th, 2020, and we are pleased to be able to be together, uh, like I said, whether electronically or in person, uh, but that God has given us this day uh, to enjoy. It is Resurrection Day, and we are Resurrection people. All right, and uh, so I just want to share a couple of announcements uh, with you. Uh, one is that we will be having uh, a memorial service for Mary Johnson here at the church on Saturday, July 25th at 2 o'clock. So you're welcome to come and uh, share in that time. Also, uh, we're going to be doing a special offering in uh, two weeks on the 26th uh, for Family Promise. Uh, Family Promise they have not been in the churches and uh, so they've been using hotel rooms and so that's an added expense for them and they were supposed to be here that last week in July this last week in July coming up so we thought we would do a special offering for them uh, to help them uh, with their costs in, uh, in having to use uh, hotel rooms so we'll be doing that on the 26th now if you want to you can mail in your contributions ahead of time for that and uh, just uh, make the check out to our church and put um, the, you know Mountain Home United Methodist don't write our church and just, you know, for, for some out there who are going to be you know <laughs> going to be funny <laughs> and it's right on the memo line family promise uh, so um, you can email, either mail a contribution in or bring one with you if you're coming on the 26th and uh, so uh, that would be a ministry that we can help support during this time. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 92. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to praise God's name, for God's steadfast love and faithfulness are with us morning and night. I'd invite you to turn to uh, hymn number 98 in your hymnal. What we're going to do, we're going to read through all three verses, but we're only going to do the chorus after the third verse. Okay, so we'll read the three verses straight through, and then at the end of the third verse, we'll tack the chorus on to the end of that. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and open the life gate that all may go in. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Great things he hath taught us, Great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Indeed, great things that God has done in us, through us, and with us. As we go into our time of prayer, I just want to update you on uh, Ian's job quest to... Um, to work with Covenant House and to, to be in an outreach ministry to homeless teens. And they told him in his interview, they said, you will be going, you know, under bridges in tunnels. I mean, they said, we really mean outreach and you're going to be going to, to all the dark corners of York City. And uh, he got a second interview for the job and he should be hearing in a couple of weeks about whether he, he is being hired or not. Uh, so uh, do keep him in your prayers 
for that. Also, my dad is having pacemaker surgery on Wednesday, and so, and I appreciate your prayers for that as well. And we continue to pray uh, for uh, Karen uh, Hallam as well, as uh, waiting to hear uh, test results there uh, from her. Are there any other prayer requests this morning? Rachel has a job interview tomorrow afternoon at 4. Right. And um, Eliza, a little seven year old girl, is one week down, um, tolerated the radiation very, very well, very positive attitude. One week down, five more to go. All right. So. Center into our time of prayer. Lord, it be great things you have done. We have recorded in your word your hand upon this world and all the, the times that you have entered into difficult situations in the world and brought glory to you. Lord, we have our own personal testimonies on that as well, ways you have been with us, you have come to us in our time of need. And so, Lord, we ask again for your intervention in this COVID virus, that you would come and stop the spread of this disease, that you would destroy it, in fact, Lord, rid the world of it, as indeed all over the world people are suffering from this. Lord, we continue to lift up those who are sick, who are battling this virus. We pray for their strength, we pray for their recovery, we pray for your spirit to that fight in them that they need to come back to wholeness. We pray for families who are grieving the loss of loved ones through this virus. Lord, may they know that you hear their, their crying. You know their tears. You weep with them. Lord, we ask your protection on those of us who have not contracted it. Responsibilities that you have given us to the best of our abilities. Lord, show us ways to be the church during this time. For those who uh, still are not ready to come back and be with us in the sanctuary yet, Lord, we, we thank you that they're watching, listening. Let them know they are a part of us. We are still all together. We are still all the church. Lord, we look forward to when we can open fully and worship fully once again, one with another. Lord, we lift up these requests that were brought before us this morning. Lord, we continue to pray for Ian and that you would continue to open doors. We thank you for the process you've been taking him through. We pray that it's brought to a conclusion and he may use these gifts that he has in working with teens. Lord, I pray for my dad and that he would just watch over his health and that the procedure would go through without any complications. Lord, we continue to pray for and can pass daughter Karen as she awaits test results. That, Lord, the, the masses that she had would be benign, that they would be operable, that you would restore her to health and wholeness. Lord, we pray for Rachel and her job interview tomorrow. We do pray you would open the door for her for that job. Lord, may you help her to relax, give her the words to say. And for Eliza, Lord, that seven-year-old and, and her courage that she is showing, we pray you continue to sustain her through these next 
next five weeks that these treatments would be able to take effect and that through your spirit and through your work through the doctors and through the medicine Lord she may be healed Lord continue to keep us mindful of the cries around us for social justice for true equality for persons of color in this country Lord some of it we may not be able to understand I mean from our way perspective but maybe be willing to listen and may you open our eyes to see the world through their eyes and to do what we can to combat systemic racism in places where you have put us and so now Lord as your people we lift up to you the prayer Jesus taught his disciples saying our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Again, this is a part in the service where I insert a word of thanks to all of you for your tithes and offerings as we are passing the offering plate, but we do still acknowledge and recognize your faithfulness in giving to our church. For those of you who uh, are still sending your contributions in, and uh, we uh, remind you uh, that you can do so uh, in, by sending it to P.O. Box 327, Mountain Home, PA, 18342. For those of you watching who are part of the Canadensis, Congregation. It's P.O. Box 23, Canadensis, PA 18325. And also our online giving option for Mountain Hope. If you just go to our Facebook page and you'll see uh, the blue rectangular button underneath the picture of the church that says Shop Now. And if you click on there, you can make a contribution either through your PayPal account or through a debit or a credit card. So praise God from whom all blessings flow. Now, before the reading of Scripture, we prepare ourselves for that time uh, by declaring our faith in God together. This morning, it's going to be number 886 in the back of your hymnal. This is an affirmation of faith that's in a responsive reading format, so you will respond with the words of bold face print. And this is entitled, The World Methodist Social Affirmation, number 886. We believe in God, creator of the world and of all people, and in Jesus Christ incarnate among us, who died and rose again, and in the Holy Spirit present with, uh, present with us to guide, strengthen, and comfort. We believe in God, We rejoice in every sign of God's kingdom in the upholding of human dignity and community, in every expression of love, justice, and reconciliation, in each act of self-giving on behalf of others, in the abundance of God's gifts entrusted to us that all may have enough, in all responsible use of the earth's resources. Glory to God, God. and honor and peace. We confess our sin, individual and collective, by silence or action through the violation of human dignity based on race, class, age, sex, nation, or faith, through the exploitation of people because of greed and indifference, through the misuse of power in personal, communal, national, and international life, through the search for security by those military and economic forces that threaten human existence, through the abuse of technology, which endangers the earth and all life upon it. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. We commit ourselves individually and as a community to the way of Christ, to take up the cross, to seek abundant life for all humanity, to struggle for peace with justice and freedom, to risk ourselves in faith, hope, and love, praying that God's kingdom may come.
scripture reading this morning takes us to Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. And while you're making your way there, I want to make you my way here. Um, just let you know we're going to be in this chapter for the next three Sundays. As I looked and saw this chapter of the lectionary readings. And I want to do... Uh, focus on this because every once in a while it's good to get back to the basics of our faith. You know, we can get caught up in in doing different things and you know different issues and and everything, and we can sometimes lose sight of you know the very foundations of our faith. Uh, you know, what what does it mean, for example, to have a relationship with God? We we throw that out there all the time, but. You know, do you ever stop to think about how that might sound to somebody who doesn't know Jesus? Well, what do you mean, have a relationship with God? You now, what exactly happens to us when we become a believer in Christ? You know, what, what does God do in our lives? And Paul really lays that out for us here in, in chapter 8. And in fact, uh, this chapter breaks down nicely into three sections. And the first one, the first section we're going to look at this morning, verses 1 through 11 really talk about God working in us. And then the next section, verses uh, 12 through 27, it, Paul is really focusing on how God works through us. And then the last section of the chapter, how God is with us. So God in us, God through us, and God with us. And that's kind of the theme that we're going to be going through as we go through Romans chapter 8 in these next three weeks. So, again, this morning, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Lord, as we open your word once again this morning, we invite your spirit to come and be our interpreter that we may be strengthened by your word and encourage one another in it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul begins this chapter with the word, therefore. There is therefore now. And, of course, one of the first rules of biblical interpretation uh, that I mentioned before, I'll mention it again, refresh your memories. One of the first rules of biblical interpretation interpretation is that when you see a therefore, you ask yourself, what is the therefore there for? Okay. Because therefore is a word of summary. It's a word of conclusion. And so well, what is Paul concluding? And so we go back. He said, okay, if I'm going to understand this therefore, then I need to understand what comes before it. And so if we go before it in chapter 7, what Paul is doing there is he's outlining for us in that chapter the war that is going on inside each of us. 
that cosmic battle that is going on between good and evil, between God and Satan that is existing in the heavenly realms, the spiritual realms, is also existing inside of us. That grand scale war has a microcosm inside of us. And Paul says, you know, in my mind, I desire to be obedient to God. But when I try to do that, I find another law working inside of me, he says. I find this law of sin and death that's working inside of me. So I want to do good. I want to please God. I want to follow God. But something keeps cutting in the way. The law of sin and death seems to override this desire I have in my mind to follow God. And so Paul says... The things I want to do, those things I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, those are the things I end up doing. And I think we can all relate to that. I think we all understand what Paul is saying. We try to please God, but something just gets in the way. And, and if you have any doubts about this war, just think about those times in your life when you've, you've been looking to self-improve. And so you might say, for example, okay, you know, I got to work on my patience, so I'm really going to be patient today, right? And so you get up in the morning, and you have this resolve, and you go through the day, and, and maybe you make it through that day. You know, maybe we don't make it till lunchtime before we lose our patience, but maybe we make it through that day somehow, but in a couple days, by the end of the week, or just, it's, you know, we find we're just right back where we were. I remember when, uh, when Ian was born, you know, and, and as he was moving into the toddler stage, I remember saying to myself, okay, now I'm going to be very patient with him. And, you know, when he asks these, when he asks all the why questions that kids ask, you know, kids just keep asking why, why, I'm going to be very patient and I'm going to answer every one of them. Yeah, well, about the third why, that was all I was doing. Right? <laughs> because I said so. <laughs> So there is this war that is going on inside of us. And it's not that, you know, we have to get that vision out of our mind of that proverbial angel on one shoulder and devil on the other. And, uh, because that image uh, suggests that we are somehow in a position of moral neutrality and that we, uh, it's just a matter of, well, which choice are we going to make? But what Paul emphasizes in chapter 7 is that we, we don't start from a morally neutral position. That the law of sin and death has overtaken us. That sin nature that we inherited from Adam and Eve as sin infected the world has infected all of us. So we're not starting from a morally neutral position in which, well, I just see which voice wins out. Paul's basically saying in chapter 7, we're trapped. We're trapped in the confines of the law and of sin and death that thwarts the things that we want to do. And you might say, well, well, why do we still even have a desire then to follow God if that's true? Because the reason is because we are all created in the image of God, and we have that image inside of us. So even though that the law of sin and death can mars that image and, and hides it in many ways, it's still there. And so we have the sense inside of us that there is a God. You know, most people, in, in, in poll after poll after poll, it's done. On this, you know, do you believe in God? Do you believe there's a heaven? Do you believe in spirituality? Uh, over 80% of people say yes. So a very, very small amount of people in the world that truly, truly believe that this world is it, that we're just a collection of chemicals, we walk around here for a while, and then, and then we're done. A very small minority of people actually believe that. Most people believe we have a spiritual side to us, and believe that there is a God of some kind. That image of God stays in us, and, and it's that image of God that, you know, that we still hold on to and say, okay, I, I want to please God. I want to do the things uh, God has told us to do. You know, there must be something more than this life. But this law of sin and death traps us. So what are we going to, what do we do about this? How do we fix it? Well, Paul concludes chapter 7 by saying, thanks be to God who has given us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, God has delivered us through Jesus Christ. 
So what we're not able to do for ourselves, God is able to do for us. And that brings us to the beginning of chapter 7. So, I mean, as chapter 8, as Paul now says, Therefore, okay, because of the fact that God has given us deliverance through Jesus Christ from power of sin and death, therefore, we have no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be a believer in Christ? What does it mean to put our faith in Christ? What happens to us when we do that? Paul says here, the first thing that happens to us is that we are no longer condemned for our sin. The penalty that we owe God for our sin, which Paul tells us earlier in Romans, which is death. The wages of sin is death, and death is eternal separation from God. It's not just about our physical bodies dying, it's about being apart from God. In Scripture, being apart from God is to be dead, to be with God is to be alive. Paul's saying there is now no condemnation. That penalty that we owe God for our sin and death has been paid for. That sin has been paid for. This is called, in the theological realm, this is called justification. It's a legal term. We have been justified, not by our own works, but by the work of Jesus Christ. We put our faith in Jesus Christ. His work of salvation is then applied to us. So as we stand before God, you know, the picture of a court of law, you know, we're standing before God and all the evidence is pointing to our guilt. Even though all the evidence of our lives points to our guilt, God declares us to be innocent because of the blood of Christ. Christ stood in our place, fulfilled all the righteous requirements of the law in his life and in his death so that our debt of sin could be paid for. God comes into our lives. God comes into our hearts and applies the salvation of Christ to us. And we are freed from this penalty of sin and death. This frees us from the power of of the sin nature that's inside of us. It doesn't free us from temptation, but it frees us from the power of that sin. In other words, now we do, because of that justification, we do have the option of actually being able to please God. You see, because even before we're a believer, you say, well, I know people don't believe in Christ and do good things. Yeah, they, you know, we still have the capacity to do some good things every once in a while, but usually even those good things that we do or we attempt to do or we try to do uh, are for some sort of uh, self, self-serving self motivation, right? Uh, most of the time we're doing something for somebody else because we're looking to get something for ourselves. Very rarely is it just purely, you know, serving somebody else or, or purely lifting somebody else up. Usually we do it because there's some there's something in it for us. That's usually what motivates us. But once we have been justified, we now actually have the ability to actually serve God. We now have the ability to actually please God. Because as long as this penalty of sin is in us and with us, we can't please God. Yeah, we can do some good things here and there. But really... Living a life that pleases God, we can't do without that salvation of Jesus Christ. And that leads us to the second part in the section that Paul talks about of what happens as God enters into our lives, as God is in us. The first thing is we're, we're justified. 
We are freed from the penalty of sin that's in our lives. The second thing that happened is that the Spirit comes into our lives. And Paul tells us in verses 5 through 11 that what the Spirit does is to begin to transform our minds. Begins to renew our minds. Begins to adjust our priorities, our desires, our goals in our lives so that what we desire matches the things that God desires. That we do actually want to please God. This is part of the regeneration, and again, in theological terms, this is called regeneration. That being born again that Jesus described for Nicodemus in John chapter 3. We are made into a new person from the inside out. From the inside out. Paul will talk about this again in Romans chapter 12 when he says, Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, that to, to be a true follower of God, we have to think differently than what the world thinks. The world teaches us, hey, look out for number one. Right? Take care of yourself first. That success in life is about you know, how many things we accumulate. God's kingdom operates on a different set of principles. Right? That the first should be last. That in order to be great, you have to serve. That in order to save your life, you have to lose it. it turns things upside down. And so we have, to, we have to learn how to live by kingdom principles. That's what the Spirit does inside of us. Renewing our minds, transforming our minds so that our thoughts become God's thoughts. Or God's thoughts become our thoughts. <laughs> Think of it that way. That's that process of regeneration. So the first thing that happens when we become a believer in Jesus Christ is that God enters into our lives and begins to work in us. Cleansing us from our sin, freeing us from the penalty of that sin, and then beginning to renew our minds, to transform our minds so that we learn how to think and act uh, by kingdom principles. That God becomes a greater priority in our lives, becomes the priority in our lives, that, that what we desire more than anything is to please God. That that becomes our heart's passion and our heart's desire. And sometimes some people question, how do I know whether I'm really a believer or not? You know, I put my faith in Christ, but how do I know that really took hold? You know, how do I know that, that it worked, that it's real? Well, Paul tells us here, he says, you know, the, the mind of the unbeliever uh, cannot submit to God, cannot submit to God's will. Those who aren't following Christ are in rebellion against God. And so what you need to do, what we need to do is look at our lives. You know, what direction have our lives been going in? You know, not did I blow it and lose my cool this morning and, you know, it makes me a terrible person. No, but what's the trajectory of your life been since you made that decision for Jesus Christ? Can you see a progression in your life? Can you see a growth in your life? You know, what, what do you care about now versus what you cared about however many years ago that was? That you put your faith in Christ. Do you see a difference? And when, we, when we've walked with Christ for a lot of years, sometimes it's hard for us to see the changes in us ourselves, but sometimes other people see them more than we do. Sometimes we get reports, you know, we get somebody to say, oh, you know, hey, I was talking to so-and-so, and they said, you know, they really see a difference in you. You go, really? <laughs> so we can just look and see, you know, what has the trajectory of our life been? Are we different people than we were? Do we have different priorities than we did before? Do we care about different things than we you know, is, is that promotion as important to us as it used to be? Is that added bonus and salary as important to us as it used to be? 
what, whatever it is, whatever you want to insert there. But what do we care about now? That's the way you can judge and gauge the reality of Christ's presence in your life, the reality of that uh, renewing work of the Spirit in your life. Is there a change in how I've been living my life? Is there a change in how I think about the world around me and how I see the world around me? That's how we can know. And so, you know, when somebody else wants to know, well, what is this? You, know, you talk about having a relationship with Christ. What is that? What does it mean? You know, why should I bother with God? What's, you know, what's, what's the difference there? We can tell them why, why you should believe in Jesus Christ is because it's only... Jesus that can give us true peace in our lives. That can fill that empty space inside of us that nothing else seems to fill. And we think of, we, we attain a certain position in our lives, we, we attain a certain income level, uh, we attain a certain possession, we think that's going to bring us happiness, and it does for a little bit, but, we're, but there's still that that gnawing inside of us, that, that empty place inside of us. And I think uh, if most people, if you talk to them and they were willing to admit it, people that don't believe in Christ, they would, they would, uh, they would say, yeah, you know, that there's still something inside of me that isn't right. You know, people can put on a great front and say, oh, I'm, I don't need God. I'm doing just fine on my own. And, you know, they lie to themselves. But all of us have had those uh, as what's often called those dark nights of the soul, those quiet times when we ask ourselves about, well, what is the future? You know, what, what happens after this world? Well, how do I know there is a God? Well, what's going to happen to me when this life is over? You know, when people have time to sit and actually think about eternity, that overwhelming force of death, a lot of people still have that uneasiness inside of them, that unsettledness, the sense of lostness. You know, if people are, are willing to admit it, it's there, I think, for the majority of people. The message that we have for those people is to say, hey, you know that 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 gnawing feeling you have inside of you, you know that, that empty space that's there inside of your heart. I know about that. I've been there. I had that empty space. Christ has filled it. Because, see, now I no longer have to worry about the future. I no longer have to worry about what's on the other side in this world. I know I belong to God. I know that God is in me. I don't have to struggle with those things That's the message we have to give to people that are trying to figure out what this God thing is all about. What Paul reminds us of is that just simply God in us, this justification, this regeneration, this isn't all that there is to the story. And that's why there are all these verses yet after verse 11. God works in us because God wants to do more in our lives. God not only wants to work in, work in us, God wants to work through us in how we relate to the world around us. And this is what Paul is going to take up next week. This is what we're going to look into. How God is not only working in us, but how God is working through us. Let's pray. this video online for all those who are gathered here for anyone or in just the community around us who might be having that gnawing feeling inside of them that something isn't right that there's still something missing from their lives 
Lord, may you speak into that space. May you open people's hearts and minds up to receive this truth, who Jesus is and what you have done for us through Jesus Christ. Thank you for reminding us of it again this morning, for taking us back to this very basic found, uh, foundation building block of our faith. Say, yeah, what does it mean to say that I believe in Christ? What does it mean to say that I have a relationship with God? Thank you for reminding us of your justification, of your regeneration. Taking away the, the guilt of our sin, paying the penalty of the debt that we owed you. Transforming our minds. We can think of the world around us differently, that we can see the world as you see it and care about the things that you care about. Lord, for anyone this morning who is longing for that, who is searching for that, who is tired of playing the denial game, who is tired of, of trying to fill their lives with things so that they don't have to hear that voice inside. Lord, may you penetrate through that. And may they not be afraid to give their lives to you. Because they know that they're doing it before God who's not coming into our lives to condemn us. But to free us for something more. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn your hymnals number 393. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Now be, may God's spirit be with us. May God's Spirit renew us. May the love of Christ flow through us. And may we go from this place and be servants of God and one another in Jesus' name.